Are we ready? We are ready. Ready. Very good. I have five o'clock. Um, so welcome everyone to the Tuesday, August 2nd, 2022 Lawrence City Commission meeting. Uh, first, we will have an executive session. When we return, we will give the announcements for the public so that they understand how the meeting is run. Uh, but at this time, I would accept any motions to move to executive session. I move that we recess into an executive session for approximately 45 minutes to discuss privileged legal communications from the city's attorneys regarding current law and policy pursuant to KSA 7543.19, subsection B2. The justification for this executive session is to keep attorney-client privilege matters confidential at this time. The city commission will resume its regular meeting with the city in the city commission room at approximately 5.50 p.m. after the executive session is concluded. Second. I have a first and second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 That passes four to zero.
We are ready to go. Sherry, you okay? Um, yes. Thank you. You're all right. Welcome everyone back to the uh, Tuesday, August 2nd, 2022 Lawrence City Commission meeting. Uh, we have had an executive session. We have nothing to report. Uh, we will move on to our regular announcements that we would have at the beginning of our meeting. And we will start with Porter Arneal. Thank you, Mayor. Good evening, everyone. I just have a few housekeeping items for this Zoom meeting. This meeting is being recorded and broadcast on the city's YouTube channel and cable channel 25. Please remember to mute yourself during the meeting unless you are speaking. The chat function for this public meeting is disabled. All chats will go directly to me. Unless you are participating during the meeting, please turn your video off. This allows the active meeting participants to be seen on screen. You will still be able to hear the meeting. When you are participating in the meeting, please turn your video on. If you have any trouble, you can send me a chat. The city reserves the right to mute people or turn individual videos off to minimize distractions during the meeting. And now I'll turn the meeting back over to Mayor Shipley. Thank you, Porter. Um, now we'll have some general um, explanation of how public comment works from Sherry Riedemann. Thank you, Mayor. When the mayor calls for public comment, individuals attending in person should approach the podium to indicate they wish to speak. The podium can be raised and lowered, and we encourage you to use this feature to ensure your comments are heard. Individuals participating via Zoom should use the raise hand function to indicate they wish to speak. Please leave your virtual hand raised until you are called on. Individuals will be called on in the order they appear on the meeting host screen. Please state your name before speaking and all comments will be limited to three minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Sherry. Uh, now we'll move on to approving the agenda. The city commission reserves the right to amend, supplement or reorder agenda during the meeting. Uh, do I have any motions to reorder or to approve? Move to approve the agenda. Second. Okay. I have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Passes four to zero. Uh, next brings us to our consent agenda. All matters listed on the consent agenda are considered under one motion and will be approved by one motion. There will be no separate discussion on those items. If the discussion is desired, that item will be removed from consent agenda and will be considered separately. Members of the public wishing to speak to an item that has been pulled off consent agenda will be limited to three minutes for comments. Are there any items city commissioners would like to remove from the consent agenda? Not seeing any. Are there any items anyone from the public would like to remove from the consent agenda? C1B with a clarification. Is that the June meeting minutes or the July? Just wanted to clarify. Um, it says June, but I was just questioning because we're now in August and June has already been received once. Uh, staff, I, I would just to, for the purposes of not disrupting this meeting, can someone clarify for sure it's June? Indeed, what is meetings. attached are the June 9th. Thank you. Thank you. Any other items to be pulled from consent in the pub in the room? Is there any? Can go I ahead. Verify, Mayor. Are yes. you still wanting that pulled yes. then? Okay. Oh, you still want it pulled? Okay. Is there anyone online who would like to pull something from the consent agenda? No, Mayor. All right, uh, let's bring it back to the commission. Are there any motions? Move to approve the consent agenda with the exception of C1B as presented. Second. I have a first and second, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Passes four to zero. Uh, that brings us to C1B, Mr. Aravi. Okay, this was the meeting, this community police review board meeting in which the chief of police told us that threats of arrest in order to coerce compliance to the illegal wishes of the police was commonplace. And it was a pattern of practice, basically. Now, we've had that called out by a number of people in the community, myself and others, directly here in different board meetings. And we still have yet to receive any kind of an answer about that. As to whether just the simple fact that police policy does not say it's a problem, are we as a city going to say that it's allowable, even though it's uh, prevented under federal law? 
I mean, that, that's really what this comes down to. We've got a federal law that says that kind of stuff should not happen. And just because it's not in policy does not mean something didn't happen that was wrong. So I guess I'm wondering what we're going to do about that. Are we going to continue to allow police just to do whatever they want because it's not in policy, even though there's federal laws that say they shouldn't? I mean, I'm open for questions, but I can keep talking. But I mean, really, that needs to be addressed because it's a big problem. Nobody. This is what I'm talking about. This is why I ridicule now. I found one person in this town today that was willing to say enough was enough and accept responsibility for something. Say the buck was stopping here. Admit it was a mistake. Nobody else is willing to do that. So you guys are okay with allowing the chief of police to say that it's okay to threaten citizens with coercion? Are, are we okay with that? During public comment, we don't respond to questions that are directed to this us. This isn't public comment. This is a uh, consent agenda item. Yeah, it's public comment on a consent agenda item. Okay. And as soon as you're done speaking, we will refer our and questions once again, to staff. Once again, if it's public comment, you're speaking during my time. I think my clock is still running there. All time is commission time. Okay. That's how it works. I see. All time is commission time. So the people don't matter? Do the people don't matter, Courtney? You know you're up for election next year. I'm putting money behind getting you out of office. Promise it. Promise it. Staff, um... Sorry, that was my timer. Um, is there any further public comment? Yep. <clears throat> that wasn't public comment. On this item. Yeah. On that item. Yeah. On that item. A commission comments? I, I wouldn't mind having the chiefs here um, okay. speak to what that was about. Or I, perhaps legal. I, I'm, I'm interested in the, this is a violation of federal law. Okay, I have asked for something. I just asked. I, I, I had asked to have a response. I, police of chief, chief of police, but also legal is very good to ask too. I, think. I don't think there's no objection. So, yeah, please. <laughs> and that's where we're at with this so, item. Mayor, my. My recommendation is um, to provide us a chance to get a response back to the commission and um, um, that enables uh, none of us to be placed on the spot where some, with something that perhaps we're not prepared to address, but we'll be happy to make, give a response to you all if that would suffice. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. Okay. Thank yeah, you. The, specifically the question of uh, whether that's allowed under federal law. Thank you for that clarification. We'll get a response for you. Thank you. That's fine. Uh, any motions? Oh, we didn't do any further public comment on this. Anyone online? Uh, no, Mayor. Commission, any discussion? <clears throat> no, ma'am. Let's uh, have a motion. I move to approve item C1B, a review of the Community Police Review Board boarding meet, meet, meeting minutes. And just so um, we're all clear, you are just receiving the minutes? That's correct. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, you're right. Sorry about that. I need a motion on that. Okay, that's even better. Yeah. That brings us on to our next items of business, which is public comment. General public comment in the room. Any general public comment? My name's Dan Katie, and I'm a taxpayer in Lawrence, and I'd like to pay less taxes. I was reading in the paper that Brad, who is not here, Finkel D, uh, had moved for a decrease in taxes, and the four of you said no. 
Inflation is eating up the small people in this town. And you're not doing a thing about it. You're just adding more taxes. We need less taxes. You know, I'm on a fixed income. I'm paying 20% more for groceries this year. What are you doing about that? You know, it's over 9% tax on groceries. And I'm not alone. There's a lot of single mothers out there that have problems. We need less tax <clears throat> and we need it now. I mean, pe people are hurting, but you don't care. All you care about is plastic bags, plastic bags and, and, a, and a progressive agenda. You say climate change. Somebody tell me what climate change is. Tell me how high is up. How high is up? Can you tell me? Tell me what climate change is. Tell me how plastic bags in Lawrence are going to do a thing about climate change. What's it going to do? Somebody tell me the measurement. I'd also like to know uh, how much we're spending on all this bus stuff. I know, I know people need transportation. But these big buses are driving around town. Nobody's on them. I mean, we got a, we got a bus that holds 30 to 50 people. And there's nobody on them. One or two people. And those people need it. But there's got to be a better solution. There's got to be a better solution than those big buses. Smaller buses would be better. Something. Somebody needs to come up with something. You know, it's just, you just throw money at stuff. And then the taxpayers have to pay for it. <clears throat> and then, then you've got, uh, <clears throat> you want to change from clean, inexpensive gas to heat, which, which comes from Western Kansas, produced by people who from Kansas, workers from Kansas. It's jobs for Kansas, that electric gas, that electric, um, not electric gas, uh, uh, natural gas to go electric. How many of you have changed your house over from gas to all electric? And if you, if you live in an apartment, Hi. you probably don't do that. Okay. Thank you. Thank and I would like to commend Brad who is not here. Can I get a point of information? We don't normally do that. Um, Believe me, I have lots yeah. to say. <laughs> Mr. Herring. Mr. Herring passed away. My I name apologize, is Joe. Joe. <laughs> <clears throat> My name is Joe Herring. Uh, I'd like to start with a short uh, quote from Thomas Jefferson. And I quote, when you abandon freedom to achieve security, you lose both and you deserve neither. End of quote. And I'd like to talk just a little bit about the criminal Federal Reserve and how we got to this mess. Uh, if you want to read a, a, a good book, uh, it's called the, uh, I'm blank here, The Creature from uh, uh, I'll think of it here in a minute. Anyway, the Titanic uh, sank in uh, 1912. And if you read this book, and I'll think of it here in a minute, uh, it tells you that all the bankers, the world bankers, were on that ship, and they did not want a Federal Reserve. And there was one, J.P. Morgan, that wanted to start a Federal Reserve. Well, in the last minute, he got off the boat. And of course, we know what happened. The Federal Reserve came into existence in 1913. And basically what it does is it prints money out of thin air. It loans it to citizens as bonds or the big lenders, or, or they loan a lot of money to the government. 
Remember, they printed out of thin air. It's fiat money. It's not backed by anything. The interest pays, the government pays them interest. That interest goes into the Federal Reserve System. What a racket. This causes inflation, just like we talked about earlier. Uh, the government says right now we're at 9%, and it's really more like 20, maybe even higher. But in 1913, $1, it takes $30 today to buy, have the same purchasing power. And this is inflation. This hurts everybody, especially the, this is a insidious tax. And everybody pays it. The politicians love it because it's a hidden tax. They don't have to explain anything. All they do is they throw out money like Halloween candy for every little person that lines up to the federal trial. And this is why we're in this mess we are. Uh, right now, there's a lot of countries that are doing away with the dollar. And we're going to go back to gold standard. So get ready. Thank you. Hello, my name is Richard Sells. I was here two weeks ago to talk to you about the proposed $12 million gun range that you're thinking about building. And as I said then, I think the police department needs a place to practice and, and, and learn how to use guns correctly, and especially the new people coming on board and the whole nine yards. I'm not against that. I'm against the $12 million. And because nothing has come out about what you're going to do or what's going to be in this building or anything else, I have to make assumptions. And you know what they say about people that assume things. So I may do that to myself tonight. Who knows? But I've heard rumors that there was a phase one, a phase two, a phase three with the police department. You know, the building you built that don't have any jail cells in it or any holding cells or anything like that. So basically, it's not a police department. It's an office building. I think this $12 million is the cover up for that. And you're going to build, I'm assuming you're going to build uh, a gun range, which they probably need, but you're also going to build the jail cells and everything else. So when it all gets done, we're not going to have a $20 million police department. We're going to have a $32 million police department. And that's all paid for by our money. And I say that that way because you pay taxes just like I do. The problem is there's about 90,000 more people than you that pay taxes and you're spending their money. And I think that when the police station was voted down and you went ahead and built it, I think you lost a lot of trust to the people because they thought their vote counted and they found out it didn't. And I'm hoping that you're going to put this new gun range up for a vote. And I hope that if it gets voted down, which I believe six or seven years ago, they tried to put in a gun range out at the Douglas County Sheriff's Department, and it was voted down by the people. And I hope if you put this up to vote uh, for the people to vote on and it votes down, I hope you don't just go ahead and build it because you're going to lose the trust of the people. And if they lose trust in who you, who are they going to trust in? There's nobody to trust in. They put you in those seats so that you could take care of Lawrence, Kansas. And a lot of people feel that you're not doing that when you did what you did. You spent $20 million. So I hope you're going to do that. I hope you let the people have a say so in it. And uh, I'm going to cut myself short tonight because I'm coming back next week because there's a chance that you it may pass and you may build it. And if there is, I have some ideals that I think are very community minded ideas and things that you ought to consider if you're going to build this thing. And so I have about a half a minute left. And so I want to tell you uh, the bag issue, the paper bag issue. <laughs> I just hope that if you're going to get rid of the pl plastic bags, I hope you'll get rid of the ordinance that says I have to carry a little bag in my pocket to pick up the dog poop because there won't be no bags to put in my pocket because you'll be getting rid of them. Thank you very much. Any other public comment in the room? Trent McKinley's out here ready to arrest me. Who in here is going to get me arrested tonight? You're going to get me arrested because I get frustrated because a commissioner finally asks the chief to explain something and it gets shut down by legal. 
I get frustrated with that because I've been coming in here for how long now? Asking for some answers. And we finally get this close to an answer. But just like I said in a video here not too long ago, legal knows not to let the chief speak off the cuff anymore. He can't be trusted to speak off the cuff. How much of a problem is that? And you guys continue. And, and Mayor, serious money. Serious money. Because what you're doing right now is you're shutting down accountability unilaterally. And when you say public time and you call it public comment, and then you interrupt and speak during my public comment and try to shame me during that public comment, that actually rises to a First Amendment violation. I don't know if you realize that or not, but the public forum doctrine does give you some rights. But when you stray outside the public forum doctrine, it does become a limit of free speech. We get extremely close but we just can't get there because certain people in this community don't want to hear it because certain people in the community know what the liability is. I know what the liability is and I'm starting to pull the documents out of these different city agencies that are proving it. Before I leave tonight at the July meeting of the community police review board, they had a Sergeant Shipley come in here and talk about implicit bias. I have a recording of that same sergeant on the street, ignoring the 1964 Civil Rights Act and city code 10110. When she tells citizens that it's perfectly acceptable for a private establishment to discriminate and not allow service to somebody based on race or sexual identity, which sexual identity may not be covered under the US constitution, but it is covered under city code. But this sergeant actually said that. Now, the problem I have with that is that's the sergeant that came in here and talked about implicit bias. Now, how in the hell can the same person that comes in here and talks how great we're doing on implicit bias doesn't even understand the 1964 Civil Rights Act or city code? We keep exonerating stuff because federal law doesn't apply. Well, this is a case where federal law and city code actually match and they mirror each other and city code actually goes further. Someday we're going to get answers. Someday somebody's going to be on a chair a little warmer than this answering some questions if we don't get some soon. Any further public comment in the room? Hi, I'm Linda Wheeler. Um, senior citizen taxpayer and so yes money does matter it's always tight but make do but i want to applaud and thank the city for the wonderful job you have done at providing facilities for young and old alike i had two granddaughters visiting with me for a long weekend we spent two hours enjoying the prairie park nature center on saturday two hours enjoying the new splash park on sunday i know when my son was growing up um, he would have absolutely loved skate park. Um, it wasn't there then, but that I know I see people out enjoying the Frisbee golf course and all of that. I, I applaud the city for providing a lot of facilities for a range of people's <clears throat> interests, physical and educational and reminding you how important the nature center is because it's something that can be used year round. It doesn't matter if it's raining. It doesn't matter if it's snowing. It can be used year round and enjoyed by everybody. And I just want to applaud the city for making those a priority um, for our citizens and keeping youth working. And those of us who have gotten to enjoy our senior years with activities to have a good time at. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other public comment in the room? Is there anyone online who has general public comment? If you do, could you use the raise your hand function on your computer so that Sherry can see you? Chris Flowers. Hi, this is Chris Flowers and I, I sent in my public comment for today. So I would just like to highlight that. Basically, um, 
I was at the fair this past week, um, volunteering at the li Libertarian booth, and next to me was um, a booth for where citizens for the county commission expanding from three to five members. They, they had a booth there, and that just got me thinking that I know you guys are working on restructuring the city government and... Mm -hmm. Basically, if you come up with something to put on the ballot, I don't think it should be be being put on um, the ballot this fall, just because I think too much time has passed. Like, what if what if there's a group of citizens that are for or against the whatever kind of ballot question we come up with? Shouldn't they have the right to, like, organize and and have the t actual time to go out and try to reach voters um like the county fairs already happened i i i would like just i mean it seems like p politicians use fairs as a way to reach people and so if the fairs already happened i i don't think we should be put in any kind of ballot question like on our next um ballot i guess in oct or in, in november um, I, I think we should just put it off till the next year or, or the year after or whenever. I mean, I, I'm undecided <clears throat> on which way I'm leaning, but I do think the public needs enough time. And I, I think if you're if like unless it's happening tomorrow, we're, we won't have a full election cycle to really study any kind of questions that might come up. Um, anyway, thank you. Any other online public comment? Uh, that's all the comments, Mayor. Great, thank you so much. That brings us to our work session. Work session provides an opportunity for the city commission to discuss items in greater detail. The commission will take no binding action on these items presented during this time. Work session topics are eligible for live public comment. Each person will be limited to three minutes. Um, this uh, Today, we will receive a strategic plan update from the safe and secure outcome team. Good evening, mayor and commissioners. Thank you for giving us some time to share with you some of the good work that we're doing. Um, tonight, we're gonna do things a little differently than we did last time. Chief Fagan's out of town, and uh, you heard a lot from me last time. So we're gonna uh, branch out into some of our other areas and hear from some of our commitment champions. So uh, in equity and inclusion, you'll hear from Lieutenant Myron Grady. In engaging and empowered teams, you'll hear from Major Casey Cooper. Um, Dennis Leslie will talk to you from the fireside, and then Megan Dodge from Human Resources will uh, talk to you about some of the other things that are happening citywide. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Lieutenant Myron Grady. Good evening. Uh, this is the first time I've ever done anything like this. I've been here for 19 years and this is my first time ever attending the city commission meeting. Welcome. Yeah, I'm glad to be what? here. Uh, do we have the PowerPoint anywhere what we're gonna talk about or? No, okay. Order. Order. Uh, on the agenda? Yeah. Yeah. Only just because it provides a few talking points that the are. Uh, That's fine. I apologize. I wasn't. No big. Aired. Uh, here we go. And bear with me because I need to share my screen. Okay. Thank you. Uh, if you just go down, I think slide four is where, there you go. So uh, basically since June 19th, when the chief created this position uh, of me being the executive officer of diversity and community engagement, uh, there's been a whole, whole heck of a lot of uh, movement, you know, a lot of stuff behind the scenes. And, and at times it feels like you're kind of drinking water from a fire hose, uh, no pun intended for my fire people. So, uh, but we've got a lot of good things going on. Uh, you know, since that time we have announced officer Allison Haddad as the LGBTQIA plus liaison. Uh, 
I know she's excited to get started. She's right now, she's currently, she went from being on vacation to military leave, or otherwise she'd probably be here speaking on behalf of some of the, th some of the great things that she's gonna do. Uh, but when we, when we start talking about some of our diversity efforts, uh, I think it's really, really important that that we use all the resources that are available to us. And I uh, have been working in uh, close concert with Dr. Muhammad and some of his staff and uh, just really trying to figure out what's best for us at the Lawrence Police Department and find something that fits. Uh, but in, in reaching out to some of our uh, partners in other jurisdictions and other agencies, you know, I've been able to kind of learn a little bit more about that diversity, equity, inclusion piece because, you know, I've been a police officer for 19 years and uh, I know how to do that job. Uh, the engagement part, I'm pretty well versed on that, but the diversity, equity, inclusion stuff is, is something new. And uh, with this opportunity that we have in front of us, want to make sure that we do it right. So I'm looking forward to kind of getting started. But you know, when, when we start talking about DEI, there's about three things that I'd like to kind of focus on. And then, you know, see how that fits within what the city of Lawrence wants, and, and ultimately what's best for our organization. But you know, uh, like to focus on the community. And that would basically mean the citizens, uh, maybe have some listening sessions and, and with some of our marginalized groups and things of that nature. And I'm not a big buzzword guy, so sorry for using those things. Uh, but we'll also like to focus on the workplace, which means our institution and hope to create the environment that we want, uh, by influencing cultures and behaviors. And then we want to focus on our workforce, our employees, uh, who are we bringing in? Why, uh, looking at ways that, that, that we can just get better and what can we do better. And I, I, you know, the thing that I've really kind of been learning is that, you know, there's a lot of cookie cutter terms when it comes to DEI and all those types of things. But uh, one thing that I, I've really been trying to dig in deeper and, and try to learn more about is evidence-based diversity. Uh, what can you measure? And, and that comes down to the, the hows, the whys, and the wins. So those are the things that we'll be kind of focusing on when it comes to the, uh, the DEI portion. And as far as the engagement part, you know, uh, that's big. Uh, that's a little bit different than community policing and, and all those types of things that go on police police work. But the main thing that I think that we're going to be tasked with when we come to engagement is uh, is the partnerships, right? The, the people in the community. Uh, I've been in constant communication with the folks over at uh, Haskell Indian Nations University, uh, black community leaders. You know, I just did a talk at the uh, the church oh a couple weeks ago. We've uh, been really reaching out with KU Athletics, Boys and Girls Club, Big Brothers, Big Sisters, Van Gogh, and that would comprise of safety talks and partnerships, mentorship, community service. Uh, obviously, the LGBTQIA plus portion that Officer Haddad is going to be focusing on, and with our help as well. Uh, and just in the month of June, since we started this on June nineteenth, we had accumulated over two hundred hours of just engagement, uh, and that would obviously include like foot patrol downtown, being uh, visible and available at the aquatic center for the kids, even handing out popsicles, uh, trying to be visible and available in the parking garages because there's a lot of things that have been going on there as of late. Uh, and the community engagement, obviously Juneteenth, we, were, we had a nice little contingent there, pride, uh, school board meetings and, and volunteering, and then our youth engagement, coaching, mentoring, police camp and scouts. So uh, we're just getting started. There's a the whole heck of a lot of work that is going to be done. Uh, and, and it's a little intimidating, to be honest, because like I said, I'm, I'm very comfortable being a police officer. I've done that for 19 years, and, and I have an understanding of how those things are supposed to work. But in digging deeper into this DEI portion, uh, and I know the chief knows this, but it's a, it's a lot of work, and I'm excited about it. I'm, I'm, I'm enthused about it, uh, if not just a little bit nervous, because I don't know exactly how I'm going to get all these things done. So <laughs> good luck. Good. He's not even here. Okay, good. I'll say that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Commission. I'm Major Casey Cooper. I'm uh, the division commander of our professional standards uh, unit or professional standards division. Um, within that is our training unit. So I'm going to talk to you tonight about our uh, safe and secure 13 outcomes for um, how training and, and, and equipment relates to part one crimes to include domestic violence and uh, uh, sexual assault incidents. Are you able to go to the next slide down? Porter? Yep. So we've actually made some pretty good strides over the course of this last year, um, fiscal year 2020. Um, it, well, let me back up. Part of our, our safe and secure is every year um, the st uh, state of Kansas requires uh, law enforcement across the state to, um, to get 40 hours of continuing education training. Part of our um, approach to our strategic plan is we've doubled that as an agency to, 
to get 80 hours. That is our goal to make sure that we're getting officers and, and employees well-trained beyond just the basic standard of what the state requires. So if you look at our uh, commitment area for engaging empowered teams in fiscal year 2020, we we're at 22% of our sworn um, employees were at 80, 80 hours or above. Um, a fiscal year for the training calendar is July 1st to June 30th. It's not the same as what we would think as a fiscal year for the city. Um, that's how we have to report our training hours to the state. So um, that was our 2020 numbers, which is at 22% at 80 or above hours. This last year, we had a 47% increase to 69% of our sworn members at 80% or above. So where we've made some great strides is um, we've been more mindful in what we're training and what we're trying to push out. We're trying to create more opportunities. I think some of this growth came from also just a lot of the COVID restrictions um, coming up. So it allowed more opportunity from outside um, the department to send employees to. Um, we had... Uh, hosted over the course of this last year. Um, we have four in-service sessions that we we host at the police department. So that part of that 40 hours that we have to provide an opportunity for employees to go to training. Um, we hold four 10-hour sessions throughout the year and, and quarters. Um, topics in those uh, those trainings had, had a wider range of, of what we, we offer. Um, there's active shooter response. Um, we, we focused on report writing and what is important for collecting data and how we want to ensure that we're getting the right information to prosecutors for successful prosecutions. Um, fair and impartial policing. Um, we, we went over the drone implementation, as you all seen, or sorry, uh, UAS is what we call it by policy. Um, we went through firearms qualifications. One of the things that we do unique, different than a lot of other agencies is the state of Kansas only um, requires us to qualify with our, our firearm one time per year. Um, at Lawrence, we actually do it two times per year. We also offer um, ongoing training on a monthly basis for open range for officers to go out and become more proficient with their firearms and to receive other trainings that, that um, you know, makes them more comfortable with, with carrying a firearm. Um, we, we implemented less lethal training as, as you've seen from recent um, social media and media <laughs> events, but we also just, uh, you know, focused on taser certification, um, OC spray, a lot of de-escalation training. All of this training that we try to do, you know, obviously incorporates officer tactics on, on whatever it is we're doing, but we really tried to, to change our mindset and pushing de-escalation to the, for, the forefront. So like, when we do trainings for traffic stops, slowing those traffic stops down and our approach, understanding, being more mindful of what it is we're doing, um, how we how we treat a person in crisis, how we how we approach all use of force situations, really just pushing that de-escalation through throughout the organization. Um, Again, we we had a lot of outside training opportunities this last year um, to to enhance this beyond the forty hours that we we offer as a department. Um, we we sent eighty seven sworn and eleven non sworn um, members in the department to eighty eight courses. These courses can range from conferences to um, the NASRO, which is the national or the North American School Resource Officer, I think is what it stands for, to crime scene processing, to homicide investigations, to domestic violence, sexual assault, uh, trauma informed, you name it, there's 88 courses that, that we've sent officers and non-sworn members to. Um, because our non-sworn members, they impact these part one crimes with us, whether it's a crime scene tech, whether it's uh, somebody in the front office that is processing paperwork to report um, statistics or to push paperwork to a, um, a prosecutor's office for, for prosecution, um, whatever it is, everybody plays an important part in our job. So that's why I included the 11 non-sworn on there. Um, at the low end, sending uh, these 99 individuals to, to all this training, it costs $100,568. That's at the low end. And, and I hate, I told the chief, I said, I'm going to throw this number out there. And I know we got some people that like to do audits and numbers that are, you know, up there probably. So I'm going to just say, this is a very rough estimate. And myself and our training lieutenant looked at this, this 100,000 is, is on the very low end. So in order to get the 69% of our department to that 80 hours or above, there's also things that go into that. And one of those is we have to worry about staffing. We have to make up staffing and move people around um, to ensure that we're getting the proper training uh, for everybody. And at, at the very rough estimate, it was give or take 4,000 hours of overtime. 
that we had to spend to ensure that we're meeting this just as a 69%. Um, you know, if somebody needs to go to training and we're short on staffing, we have to fill the staffing on the street. If somebody has to be certified for a specific task, whether it's for computer forensics or something like that, and we have to send somebody to that, we have to backfill their position. So there's a greater cost than the 100,000. So I don't want to be disingenuous and, you know, something come up later. This is at the very low end. I can tell you that number for sure. So um, other ways that we have looked at enhancing our training is through um, something that we do. I'm actually very proud of it um, is our Lexapol policy manual. And um, we've gotten like the gold star award from Lexapol um, for, well, we went into Lexapol in 2020 and every year we've, we've exceeded all the other agencies are at the top level of what they're, I don't want to say exceeded all other agencies. We're at the top level of their standard, which is the gold achievement award. Um, we do a policy review and acknowledgement every year. A lot of agencies don't do that. So starting in January, that first week, we push every policy that we have on a cycle of, of batches of 10 to 15 policies out. Members are supposed to read and acknowledge these policies, and we can track that. We also do um, scenario-based uh, daily training bulletins that are related to these policies, and I'm going to try to see if I can share this. Porter, you may have to walk me through uh, this. I'm going to have to stop share, and then you should be able to share yep. those. See if this works. <coughs> See it? Okay. So part of our um, our commitment to ensuring that that we have good policies is ensuring that we're training employees to policies. So I'm, I'm pretty proud of, of what we do as an agency in this aspect. Is we have value based policies. Can I zoom? Can't even see it. I'm sorry. Uh, um, there's see the uh, magnifying glass up. No, the it's upper covered right. by your screen here, Porter. And Chief, I need you to get this because they don't pay me to do double time. <laughs> That's a little bit too big there. There you can scroll with that. Okay. There you go. Sorry. I'm not, that better. I'm not the best at technology. We all have to wrestle with I'll, technology. I'll go through that training later. Um, <laughs> so part of our policies is we have a value-based policy. And in, to ensure that we're meeting, uh, meeting these values and the commitments and the expectations of the chief and the commission and the city manager is we've got to make sure that we're training to the standards of these policies. And that's what these do. These are called daily training bulletins or scenario-based daily training bulletins. And we get training hours for our CPO certifications by doing these. We can get up to 20 um, hours per year with this. So an officer, well, every sworn member actually gets these scenarios. So you can see a scenario uh, and it ranges. It's Lexapol puts these out and then myself and our training, my training lieutenant will go through these and the ones that apply to our policies will publish the ones that we don't have like a correction facility we wouldn't publish. But the officers uh, will read a scenario as they get done with that scenario it ask them, you know, you can read for yourself there. What was the problem with this? Then it points them to the manual within the policy that says, here's why this question came from. And this is the policy that covers that question. Then, sorry. Try not to make you sick here. Then there's an analysis of that situation and how it relates to the policy. And then there's a conclusion. Then... I'm going to have to try to exit this and go to the next, uh, there we go. Then after they get with that, they have a question that's, that's offered. Are you able to see it up there, Commissioner? Um, and it asks them a question. Some questions are true or false. Some of them are multiple choice. Um, and it forces you to, to see the right answer. So if you choose the wrong answer, it's going to tell you, no, that's wrong. And it'll make you uh, go in and, and find the right answer. That's all goes again towards our C post and it's, it upholds us to our, our expectation and standards and training um, to our policies. Um, it's all important. And this is something I, I told the chief I was going to add in here. I can stop sharing Porter. I just don't know how to do this. You want to go back to the PowerPoint? Yeah. So when we talk about these, um, 
the outcomes of the strategic plan and what is the best gauge that we can, you know, gauge ourselves as a city on. You know, and I think everybody has heard the news about the double homicides this weekend and really as tragic as that is, it, it is an ability for us as a department, as first responders to gauge how we reinforce what the city expects us to do, the community expects us to do through our training, through our policies. So from the initial onset, you have officer's response to, to a shooting. Then you have second uh, shooting that comes out within a matter of minutes. So now we have two complex scenes that officers are trying to manage. They're trying to do critical uh, to collect critical information to make sure that we can safeguard the rest of the, the community. Um, we have, again, two complex scenes that are spread across the city. Investigations is now pulled into the mix. The detectives are coming in and intermingling with patrol officers. We have outside agencies from LDCFM to the Douglas Sheriff, uh, Douglas County Sheriff's Department that's helping us. Um, we now start locating where suspects are at. We now have three different locations that we got to work through as a department. Um, then we get into a car chase. We get into you know officers being fired at. Uh, we get a, a, a high-risk traffic stop out on the east side of, of Lawrence, where we're now able to, and I just want to rehash, we have two crime scenes where somebody's been killed. We have a location where the suspect was at. So we have multiple locations across the city that we're trying to secure and manage. We have a trail of gunfire that led us from where the suspect was at to now where we've got them stopped. And then when we get stopped, this is really important to highlight is officers didn't they didn't see what you all see in movies or didn't do what you see in movies they didn't do what you see on youtube channels or you know mainstream media they used everything that they were trained on they fell back to de-escalation time distance being calm under pressure who's calm under pressure when i'm getting shot at good trained officers right that are reinforced with expectations they maintain their area they got the suspect out of the out of the vehicle we implemented the drone for cover. We had less lethal era, I'm sorry, protection out there with our, our bunkers. It, I mean, you couldn't write it better from a standpoint of law enforcement. You know, we, we unfortunately, tragic incident, two people were lost. But because these officers were so well trained, they just fell back to their training to where they were able to safeguard the community from more damage, more harm, and more lives lost. So I just want to say that's a good gauge of what we do as a department and how we reinforce that in our training and our policies and the standards and expectations from the chief, from the city manager's office and from all of you. So that's it. Thanks. I'm not sure I could follow that very well. <clears throat> so my name is Dennis Leslie. I'm the uh, training chief for the Lawrence Douglas County Fire Medical Department. And also uh, along with uh, Captain Cooper's uh, training uh, theory. We we do a lot of training within the fire department. As a matter of fact, uh, us being a uh, organization that's both accredited and then has an ISO rating of one, uh, kind of puts us into a position where we have to do a lot of training. We uh, are required by the ISO um, ISO rating of one to do 228 hours of training per firefighter per year. Um, that's not uh, including the required amount of hours for EMS uh, certification level, which is different depending on the different certification level. <clears throat> so, uh, and, and our challenge with that, as you can see in the graphic, in 2020, I believe our, our percentage was about 56% of our staff were able to receive the required number of hours just related to the firefighter training. In uh, 2021, we reached about 64%. Um, and this is, I think, probably a, the, the biggest reflection, I think, on this is just simply that our call volume is increasing and our demand of services are increasing. Our coverage area is increasing. So we're having less and less time. Just today, we were doing some high-rise training, and it sounds kind of funny doing high-rise training in a parking garage, but it obviously it was a simulated high-rise training. Uh, and during the time we were doing the high-rise training, we ran out of resources in the city and had to stop training so that we could send people to go respond to emergency calls. So... Um, you know, this increase in, in uh, call volume is, in, is impacting our ability to complete the required number of training hours per year for each of our uh, members. Um, I also, just after talking with Captain Cooper about some training stuff, and I knew what he included in his uh, presentation, <clears throat> just to give you an idea, uh, in, let's see, in 2020, 
we, we also, besides the department level training that we do, and we have training on our schedule nearly every day, I would say maybe uh, 10 days a year, we don't have training and that's Monday through Friday, 10 days a year, we don't have training on our calendar. And that's to give some buffer for things that come up uh, unexpectedly that we have to move some things around. So we're training nearly every day with our, with our training division and all of the employees trying to accomplish this goal. In addition to those, that training, we uh, had 54 opportunities outside of the department, whether that's a, a conference or a specific skill somebody went to go acquire, or if they have a, a skill incentive that they need to go and get some additional training on that, that's additional. Uh, in 2021, that was um, 62 different training opportunities. And this year so far, 44 different training opportunities. So while we continue to move forward and try to attain this goal of 228 hours per person, it's, it is, in, I, I, you know, it's, it's difficult to get it all completed. We do our best. Um, I know we re, this year we had a, a, an audit by the ISO folks. They came out and looked at our training documents and all of the things that they look into, our response capabilities, the water supply, the whole, uh, their whole uh, investigation or assessment of our, our processes here in the city of Lawrence. <clears throat> I haven't heard back yet uh, de definitively on where we're going to be. I feel like we're in okay water right now, but um, as we continue on with an increased call volume, de you know, minimizing the number of hours that we're able to get our training completed, I think we're going to have uh, some, maybe some issues with that in the future. So needs to be addressed at some point. Um, then if you would go to the next slide, Porter. <clears throat> the next slide is about, um, in our department being accredited, we have we do our own strategic plan. Our strategic plan ties in specifically with the city's strategic plan. And I wanna talk a little bit about how our engaged and empowered teams and what we did in our department recently, uh, how these things tie together. So we identified within our department and our internal stakeholders that one of our issues we needed to address was uh, communications, top to bottom, bottom to top. So uh, we developed uh, out of the strategic plan, they, they developed a few goals. Um, one of those goals was to put a committee together, try to figure out how we can solve this problem and increase our communication and effectiveness of the communication throughout the organization. Um, they gave themselves about six months to get this done. The group got together. They have done this within about three months and now they're moving on to the next goal so that we can uh, improve how we operate within the fire medical department, um, making more transparency at all levels, involving more and more people all the time we've had in this committee that they formed. Um, it's every slice of our department, uh, every rank, um, every shift, so on and so forth. We try to involve everybody at every level. Um, and that's really just uh, wanted to highlight a couple of things for you. Um, I know right after me is Megan Dodge and, and uh, she's the HR director. Megan is going to be joining us via Zoom, I believe. I'm so here. you're ready for, her. okay, thank you. Thanks, Dennis. Yeah, good evening, Mayor and Commissioners. Um, I, like Dennis said, I'm Megan Dodge from Human Resources. Um, thanks for the opportunity to maybe give a little bit more context about the commitment area of engaged and empowered teams kind of building on the work that's being done within fire med and within police in this commitment area, but kind of looking a little bit more broadly um, at the citywide efforts. Um, and so this slide just shows, um, you know, we have performance indicators um, within each outcome area that are related to engaged and empowered teams. Um, most of them, and these are the two, uh, or two of them, in addition to the training ones that you saw these are the two that are um, measuring the employee engagement index for both police and fire medical. Um, we have also employee engagement index that we measure for um, several of the other outcome areas, but um, just wanted to highlight that. And I'll talk a little bit more about how we come up with what that index is each year. Um, Porter, next slide, please. Okay, so within this in, uh, commitment area of engagement and power teams, we have several strategies. Um, we have a, a citywide team that's really focused on this and we meet regularly with uh, representatives from each, um, from each department and from throughout the outcome areas so that we can have a really kind of coordinated and holistic approach. 
Um, these are some of our strategies within this commitment area. Um, really with engaged and empowered teams, we want to create an organizational culture where people who work for the city feel trusted, um, supported and cared for as we work together to build community. And so um, some of the strategies that we've developed are um, you know, listed here. It's really about creating a welcoming environment where people feel like they have um, space for autonomy, that, where they feel like they can um, bring new ideas forward and be innovative, focus on continuous improvement um, and then also it's about building trust throughout all levels of the organization, encouraging feedback and creating open two-way communication within, depart within you know, work groups, across departments, really across the whole organization, up and down and across horizontally. Um, and then also we recognize that it's really important to celebrate and recognize our successes and express open appreciation. And so our Engaged and Empowered Teams commitment group um, focuses on, you know, programs, on initiatives that can advance these strategies. But really the foundation for this, um, this work is trying to be data driven and, and really under gauging where employees are, how they feel, um, what their engagement is. And so that's where the um, employee engagement survey comes in. Um, this will be, uh, we're working on getting that survey out for year number three. Um, and we're actually working with Wichita State University, which I'm really excited about that partnership. Um, they're helping us to, um, you know, create it. And really, we're using mostly the same questions that have been used for the first two years because we really want to be able to benchmark and track our progress um, across years um, and then develop strategies that are based on that data. But Wichita State is helping us to develop that and really look at the questions and see what other topics we want to consider given where we are as an organization and as a society, as, a, as an employer, um, and then um, help us with de deployment and tracking of data. And so Wichita State is going to be our partner in that this year, and we're getting ready to deploy that engagement survey. Um, so excited about that. And really, once we get those results back, we'll be working um, from that data, knowing that you know we want to move that employee engagement index up as we and you know develop strategies that will really quote unquote move that needle um and so the way that we develop the the way that we quantify that index and look at what the the result is within each performance indicator is um by quantifying um it's basically a scale a survey scale and it's um the higher the number, um, and it's really like an average from all the survey results, the higher the number, the higher the employee engagement index. So that's kind of, as you kind of, if you look at our website and look at the KPIs in this commitment area, that's how we quantify those results. Um, along with the employee engagement survey, I'm excited. We're looking at doing um, uh, something called the Kids Are Good Business Survey. This is a statewide um, effort that's being um sponsored by KCSL, the Kansas Children's Service League. And it's really an initiative to encourage many employers across Kansas to deploy a survey for their employees about, hey, how family friendly are we as employers? And what kind of policies based on the feedback we get, what kind of policies can we um, advance as employers to you know, really support um, families, knowing that our employees have networks that they support beyond just being an employee. They have these whole lives. And so I'm excited. We're, we're looking at doing that in concert with the employee engagement survey. And that Kids Are Good Business survey is really, it's a statewide effort. So it's exciting to look at being a part of that statewide um, survey project. So we're looking at rolling that out. And really, it's about advancing that two-way communication. Um, and really encouraging employees to give us their feedback and, and so that we can be more strategic in our in working within this commitment area. Um, so another thing that you see a screenshot there, the HR spotlight, that's just something that, you know, as we look at effective communication for employees, we want there to be um, relevant, timely um, information shared with employees so that people feel connected and they feel like they're in the know about what's going on and that they have relevant information. So that's just one thing that we've started doing from a human resources office, um, sending that out monthly with relevant information about our benefits and things like that. So we're just looking at how can we be more effective with that communication. 
and you heard, heard that highlighted by Dennis as well. That's something they're working on in fire med. And, and we know those efforts are important and going on in departments as well, but looking at it um, citywide as well. So uh, next slide, please. Just wanted to highlight a couple of the other strategies in this commitment area that, that we're focused on. Um, providing safe environments and programs that um, promote and encourage physical, mental, and emotional well-being of city employees. So a um, few things to mention here. Uh, new this year, um, we started covering mental health treatment at 100%. So we really want to encourage employees to um, access those resources, um, knowing how important uh, mental health is and, and really advancing that from, um, you know, in, in many different ways. But we know that um, as employees look to utilize our um, health insurance program, we want to encourage, you know, mental health is an important part of that, of, of whole health, right? Um, we also have an employee assistance program, um, which is available um, for all employees and for their, for their families. Um, and it um, offers a whole range, and you can see this image here, of some of the ranges of, of services that are provided through the EAP. Um, it's through New Directions and um, employees can access a lot of different kind of expert advice on uh, legal matters or just on it, various stressful situations that they're going through. Um, advice on things like caring for loved ones or managing debt and finances. Um, and really exciting, they can also get six free counseling um, sessions per issue. And so it's not just six sessions per year, but it's per issue or, or, you know, matter that they're dealing with in their life. Um, also wanted to mention that there's also a first responder EAP program where there's, um, for employees that are first responders, they can access mental health treatment um, by providers that are um, specialized in the treatment and care of first responders. So that's an important service that we like to advance for our, for those employees as well. Um, and then also um, another important strategy in this commitment area is compensating and rewarding employees so that they can focus on those long-term outcomes on their important work and serve our community. And so we want to make sure that we're doing everything we can to compensate um, in a way so that that's not a major worry for employees and they can focus on that important work that they come to do every day. Um, and so, you know, that's something we've talked about in the city budget and thank you for your support commissioners. Um, you know, we're on a two year cycle right now where there were uh, $5 million in new compensation for this fiscal year. And we're looking at phase two for that, the 5 million additional uh, funds for new compensation next year as well. So um, just wanted to highlight that and thank you for your support on that. And that wraps up my, um, my presentation. Thank you for the opportunity. Okay, I'm back again. <clears throat> So uh, just briefly, I want to touch on a couple things listed at the very top, evaluating LDCF from response model and service levels. And a couple things listed there is the mobile integrated health unit. And uh, <clears throat> the important piece about this is we have oftentimes we'll tie up emergency resources for non-emergency functions. And this is giving us an opportunity to send a non-emergency resource to a non-emergency incident helping people who need help, but not necessarily at, at the emergency level. There's a lot more work being done in that. Uh, chief Joel's, our EMS chief, is the one that's going to be overseeing that program. I don't want to, I don't, I don't want to steal his thunder. I don't know as much about it as he does, but I just want to say that that's going to help offer a little bit of relief off of our responses. Uh, emergency responses for non-emergency um, incidents. It's not going to solve our problem completely, but it is definitely going to offer just a tad bit of a reprieve. <clears throat> The other thing on there, I think, was um, my screen has changed. And I don't know what's is a community risk reduction effort. So, you know, obviously, uh, one of the things we can, we're concerned about is if, if we can do education and prevention before we have a problem, then we've we're we're solving some of those other issues as well. Some of those might be things like responding to fire alarms continuously, the same location for the same problem. And so I know Chief King, who's our uh, chief of prevention, he's gonna be dealing with that a little bit more and talking to you more in those in detail in the future. But just wanted to highlight a couple things that you know, efforts that are in the in the works or at least in our desire. The mobile integrated health thing, I, I believe it's been funded by the county. So I think we're moving forward there. It's just gonna take a little bit of time to get that rolling and, and hopefully we'll see some benefits from that very shortly. Hello there, it's me again, and I'm going to see if I can get the screen back here. 
I think we're having some technical issues. Okay. Can sure. we get the slide up there or um, that screen? I'm not, yeah, I'm trying to figure out. Okay, it was there. Um, we should talk about a commercial for a second. We're having some problems. Mm. Okay. Okay. Uh, let's have a break for five minutes.
Close hammer. Welcome back, everyone. We had some technical difficulties. Uh, looks like we're okay. Let's see if our slides and everything come up here. All right, you ready for me? Porter. I think we're ready and sure. everything seems to be working knock right. on wood. Oh, I see, okay, carry on. Thank I you. I am off the cuff, so I'm just gonna caution you about that. <laughs> oh. Um, so one of the things that Major Cooper talked about was trying to create time for uh, our officers to go to training. So some of the things that we've done to help do that um, involves some service level changes. So um, we are no longer dispatching to respond to medical calls. We used to go on every medical call and we finally realized that you really don't need a police officer if somebody's having a heart attack. So we don't go on those calls anymore. We've modified our response to lower priority calls. So typically when the call comes in, we go, but now if it's something that doesn't um, need an immediate response, we wait until we have enough units in service to respond to those calls. It doesn't affect the outcome of the call. It doesn't affect any citizen satisfaction, and, but we're able to manage those much better. The other thing we're gonna to continue to do is examine our response to the following calls, funeral escorts. Right now we do funeral escorts at no cost. Um, that's just a service we provide. Uh, civil standbys, these are very frequent. Uh, when we have custody issues with parents, drop-offs, those kinds of things, we actually go to the scene where they call us to handle those things. And usually we're just standing by to make sure that everything gets handled peacefully. Um, we're looking at maybe telling people, you can come to the police station and handle that, but we're not gonna go to where you are anymore unless there's a disturbance or need for us to be there. Dog barking calls. Um, this is something that we do still respond on from time to time. Um, I need to have somebody come to my house because we're having a lot of dogs barking in my neighborhood, but um, I haven't called anybody yet. So um, we may not be doing that anymore. Uh, private property accidents. Um, we still, we don't take a report on private property accidents, but we still respond and give people a sheet to exchange information. We may be able to do this in a better way just by just having the form online. We can direct people to the city's website where they can uh, get that information. Parking complaints are another one. Um, again, if it's in your neighborhood, it's a very important thing and I'm not trying to minimize how important they are, but it's something that sometimes resolves itself uh, before we're able to get there or maybe we look at other parts of the city who could handle that. Maybe our parking folks could handle that. Here's some, an interesting uh, little piece of data about traffic enforcement changes. So um, in June of 2020, we deprioritized traffic stops. Um, there was a lot going on in 2020, as you all remember, um, most of it negative toward police. There was a lot of there was a lot of us looking at um, what police do and how that fits in and what our community wants from their police department. So what we tried to do is we told officers to use education over a citation. So in, in other words, if we see somebody and there's a taillight out or they ran a red light or they were speeding, we would tell them, hey, you need to get that fixed or you know, it's dangerous because of this or we're having a lot of problem with speeding motorists, appreciate it if you'd slow down. We didn't issue tickets. Um, during this time, uh, citations went down. And here's the interesting thing, because in my police mind, I think when citations go down, accidents should go up. It was the opposite. So citations are down, but traffic accidents are down as well. So if you look at 2019, we wrote 85 citations per 1,000 residents. We had 24.1 non-injury crashes and 2.8 injury crashes. In 2020, we wrote less than or more than half the tickets, 38 per 1,000. We had 17.5 crashes per 1,000 and 2.2 injury crashes. Now, there wasn't a whole lot of driving going on, so that contributed to that as well. But look at 2021, when we're kind of back to what I would call normal as, as far as people moving around. Half, about half as many citations, 43. Non-injury crashes actually dropped again. And so, and then uh, fatal or injury crashes were up just a little bit from 2020. So I think what we're seeing here is, um, one, we need to challenge our processes. We need to make sure that um, what we're doing is working. And so if I were to take my limited resources and focus them on traffic enforcement, I don't know that I'm going to change non-injury crashes. We're already doing that. It's all, they're already going down. So one of the things we're going to keep an eye on is how, would, how do we do traffic enforcement? Um, we're not doing what I would call cherry picking traffic enforcement. We're focusing our, our efforts on areas where it needs to be done. Next slide. That was the last slide. So I also um, forgot to mention Dennis Kyder's slide deck at the beginning of the second slide. 
had all of our partners and I apologize. I forgot to mention them. Um, we've got, uh, yeah, if you go back, back to that one, uh, obviously the police and, uh, uh, fire departments, but also our emergency management agency, the city manager's office, the library, Willow domestic violence shelter, um, public health department, and then, um, uh, the planning development services from the city as well. So just wanted to mention them as being partners in safe and secure as well. And we are now ready for questions if you should have any. Thank you so much, Chief. Is there any questions? Yes, ma'am. I have a couple. Um, on the slide five, in regards to the annual, pol the annual policy review and acknowledgement mm -hmm. In regards to that policy review, at, at, and I know, I think it was Lieutenant Co uh, Captain Cooper that said it's 10 and, and you're acknowledging, is the policy review process the fact that you're reviewing them? Are you reviewing them for technical changes, recommendations for amendments, or is it just, I saw these 10, I acknowledge and sign it? Both, all of it. Okay. So whenever there's a major um, policy update, so like, let's say if there was a legal change, whether it's from a federal or state standpoint. Um, <clears throat> Lexapol has a team of attorneys that pushes out policy updates. And those policy updates will come out quarterly, usually, unless it's something that's that's very important and aspect of like how our job would change. Um, then when we go to do our own policy acknowledgements, so let me talk about those last ones. When we get those policy acknowledge acknowledgements that go through a process, we will oftentimes get um, the city attorney's office involved with those if it's something that's legal. We will review them. We will push them out. Everybody is to review the, the policies and read them. And the nice thing about it is they can pull up the newly published policy and compare it to the old policy so they can see what changes have been made. And then they acknowledge it and sign it um, electronically. Um, what that has sparked is either, hey, there's a typo in this. I mean, I know that officers and employees are reading them because I get those emails all the time. Hey, there's a typo here or this no longer pertains to us because we don't use X equipment anymore that maybe didn't get to me that we don't have this. So I do know that that happens. And the same thing happens when we do the, the policy reviews on the annual basis. We'll just push them, push them out in batches. They'll read them um, and, and acknowledge that they exist and acknowledge that they read them. Okay. So yeah. on an annual basis, you're actually on pushing them out. Annual yep. basis, reviewing yep. policy make. And then okay. even, correct. And then even Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Oh, okay. Even when there's hot topics, right? So in 2020, we saw the civil unrest around the United States going on. We pushed out policies that were pertained to that. So civil, um, the First Amendment policies that covered like, you know, right to protest, right to, to do that freedom of speech, yeah. use of force um, things that, and, you know, that were tied to what sparked that and how we would respond. So we can always push out policies of, hey, this is a trend that we're seeing across the nation or something that we seem to be be dealing with a lot and we can push it out whenever we want to. But the annual acknowledgement is really just to go out there and to get more eyes than just myself, the other majors, the chief and the city attorney's office, their eyes on the policies. That's to get everybody's eyes on that policy to make sure it's still relevant and then it's up to date. And then in regards to the training and training topics, I know in the strategy, it said to train and equip personnel to effectively respond, part one offenses involving sexual and domestic violence. And I know in the CityGate report, um, it did look at top dispatch calls, and most of those were kind of the social impact calls. When I'm looking at these topics under the 40 hours, but I know that our police department is doing 80 I'm not seeing the connection to where there's been training to, you know, trainings that kind of align with or how to understand calls that relate to social impact, maybe the sexual or domestic violence. So I guess, are there training topics or core competencies within trainings like, you know, and I use the example of, of child care. Mm -hmm. Child care has core competencies around professional development, you know, social, emotional, blah, blah, blah. So all of these in regards to active shooting, report writing, fair and impartial policing, are they part of a bucket that is a category or core competency that officers can pull their trainings from, or is it just kind of a... So the 40 hours that, that you're asking about there, mm -hmm. that's what the department hosted, like that the we had our own trainers come in to do. Then we had other trainings like um, the sexual informed trauma uh, sexual assault 
informed trauma training. That's stuff that we send people to. Okay. Um, we don't necessarily have, and I don't, I don't believe we have any instructors that would be certified to teach the trauma informed. I could be wrong, but I don't have that information in front of me. Okay. So we usually seek outside assistance for that. And that's why that's not on that list. But those are part of the 88 other courses that are out there, whether it's domestic violence response, um, you know, critical incident response, all of it ties together. Right. Um, you know, interview and interrogation, we hosted an interview and interrogation school at the police department that would tie into both of those. That would tie into everything because it's how we interact with the public on any kind of call is how we should act on every call. Right. Um, everybody should be treated very well. Then when you go to the uh, trauma informed training, there's different approaches to that. And that's why we have the specialized training in that. Does that make sense? So yeah. So there, at least there's some diversity within yes. the training topic. So if someone wanted to kind of maybe deal into some tier one, tier two of a topic they can, but they're, they're pretty expansive and broad as far as the training topics. Right. And, and we're actually expanding upon that this year. I mean, we're in the infancy phase of phase of looking at how we're going to do next year, not the fiscal year, but actually the calendar year of 2023 mm -hmm. of our in-service training um, and ensuring that we're getting pretty much exactly what you just asked is in batches of, Hey, this, this training looks really good. And this is what I want to go to versus everybody going through a, um, something that maybe doesn't necessarily pertain to them. Right. So detectives may not need to go to a, a traffic stop training. So let's look at doing other things for them, whether it's the trauma informed training or digital forensics evidence recovery. And we're trying to make that to, to do your core competencies. Those are things we're working on right now. We're working on a program to track our training better. So I think this next year, you're going to see that 69% go up even higher because for years we didn't have as good a system as we have now, which we actually use it's vector solutions across the city. The PD is kind of late to the game in that of using that to track our training. But um, I'm, I'm really hopeful that we will see those positive changes next year. Okay. And then this is a question in regards to the equity inclusion piece. So this is uh, Lieutenant Grady, you can chime in on this. I, I was looking at the partners and this is where kind of the question comes in at. So are with your new position, are you partnering? Is, is this group meeting as partners? I know you said you mentioned speaking with Dr. Muhammad. I know Dr. Muhammad's part of our higher level of DEI work between partners in the community with the university, with the health department, with the county. Have you been elevated to that as well so that you're with community partners and core with other cohorts that are doing this? Not work? yet. Not yet. Uh, and, and like I said, you know, just a little bit of grace because I just really got into this position June 19th. And, and with that, I was coming off of patrol and trying to finish up a lot of things like that. So but that would be the uh, ultimate outcome. And the ultimate hope is because we want to be good partner, partner or good agency and partners with everybody, uh, stakeholders in the community. So absolutely. Okay. And if I might add something, Commissioner, um, one of the things when I was talking to Lieutenant Grady about this position, he wanted to know what I wanted him to do. And I gave him almost no direction. I said, I, I, you've got a blank slate. I want you to write um, what you're going to be doing, who you're going to be doing it with. But here's what I need. I need to have someone who can see the blind spots within the department as it relates to racial equity and diversity. I need somebody out in the community who can be that advocate for people who are of color, who are underserved, who are underrepresented, so that they have an avenue to come to us from the community. Outside of that, we've got all kinds of bridges to build and all kinds of opportunity. I didn't want to constrain him with just my vision because he's got a great vision for these things. And so I think he's going to do a lot of great work with it. And then last question, and then I'll yield to my fellow commissioners. Um, this question is for Dennis. Dennis got excited about the mobile integrated health unit. Um, and I know you didn't want to speak too much to it, but I just kind of wanted an idea of, is are we thinking this is something that's collaborative work with, you know, hospital, health department? Is it the idea to pull them in? Or what do we see the end goal of, the integrated health unit is this to be a connector, um, a gap filler for those who are needing emergent care or just uh, access to care, and 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 they're, so they're not using an emergent um, system. Or can, can you just kind of sure me a little bit? I think it's going to be a few things. <clears throat> um, like I said earlier, it's going to be a response to non-emergency calls for non with a non-emergency vehicle, right? But that's going to be able to take those specialized people 
and put our customers in touch with the services that they need throughout the community. So it may be a follow-up visit from the hospital. It may be uh, connecting them with some uh, visiting nurses or some other uh, oper- some other uh, resource in the community that they're not com- connected with. And these folks would be more versed in that. I believe that's the focus of it. I know that um, in the past, we've looked at this model with uh, collaboration between uh, our department and the hospital. The, the, I believe that the county funded two positions. And so I don't know what that's going to look like uh, in the end. Thank you. Any other questions? I uh, just have one uh, for uh, Major Cooper. Uh, and I know that you were speaking also to um, uh, the changes in practice, especially uh, de-escalation and in terms of the mental, you know, a person going to a mental health crisis. I know it's pretty early in the game with the crisis center starting up. Have Has it, and what you've seen so far, has it proved to be a, a valuable asset and um, assistance or a, a soft handoff for the, those situations when, when that person is having a mental health crisis? Make sure I understand your question. Yeah, the de-escalation training yeah, being yeah. the positive, or the crisis center being the positive. Um, both, both. I mean, it's. A, I know that you're you're participating in that de-escalation training on your side, right. but um, as a part of that, being like, hey, this is probably something that I'm not trained to deal with. How about if I can go ahead and get them to a person or place that you know can right. adequately deal with this so the last piece of that getting them to somebody that they can you know deal with their you know critical incident or their right. crisis at that moment that's more of the cit training okay um that has an aspect of de-escalation training in it um we have officers or you know i think we're going to try to get a class this next year again calendar year 2023 not fiscal year of our training year for another cit class to get more people in the department trained just because we've had a high turnover rate in the last few years um but the other side of the de-escalation is more than just dealing with a person in crisis it's really trying to just slow down the situation not rushing into something um, I always use it, don't go buy the real estate that you're not ready to own yet. Yeah. Um, and it's really just trying to instill and reinforce that time distance barriers in between whatever the, the situation may be. Don't, don't have an officer induced use of force. Let's try to get more resources there. Let's get time there. So that's one of the aspects that we do with the de-escalation. And that's really what we're trying uh, to, to marry those together, right? Because it's not always just a person in crisis that we're dealing with, with when it comes to de-escalating. I mean, it could just be an argument between two people. We don't need to go in there screaming and shouting. We got to de-escalate that the, the right way. So that's really where we're taking our de-escalation training. And really how we reinforce that is through, um, we have reality-based training um, instructors that back to the core competency aspect of it is we used to be all of us, us three here, you know, we're cops. We, we kind of came up in the old day of a high school football coach, you were given a scenario. And if you failed, you got screamed and yelled at, you never really knew why you got yelled at uh, or why you were getting yelled at. Now, the way we do it is it's more of the adult based learning um, where we implement this slow it down approach that how do you feel? We reinforce positive behavior. Um, You know, like, how are you feeling with this? We slow it down, stop the scenario. And that's how we get to, um, you know, where I think where you're at, yeah. what your question is, right? Is seeing where the positives come out of it. Right. Maybe I hope that answers your question. No, I mean, it, 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 it did to a very deep extent. Okay. I, I'm glad to see that that emphasis is being put on that. And I think to your point about the treatment center, I don't think they're open for business yet. Okay. When they had the ribbon cutting, they were still a month or so away from that. So I don't know that we actually had our first drop off okay. encounter yet, but we're, I think that's going to be a huge benefit for us because now we've got a place where we can take somebody who's in a mental health crisis and drop them off and they're going to get treatment right away. It's not going to be like waiting in the ER for somebody to get treated or anything like that. So I'm looking forward to it being, being open and available to us. Thank you. Yes. Any other questions? No, I just want to thank folks for, for bringing us updating us on this. It, it looks like the numbers that need to go up are going up, which is good. And the numbers that, you know, we would all, all like to see go down traffic citations. Yeah. It's good too. So, so thank you very much for your work on this, everybody. Yeah. Well, and thank you all for letting us tell our story. Um, I, I think that's part of what I've seen so far in the, the six months I've been here is you all have, and we all have, and not, not you, because I'm part of it now, an amazing police department, an amazing fire department, and um, being able to come and share these stories with you and, and show you the great work that the people that you 
represent are doing in this community is really amazing. And I just want to echo what Major Cooper said about um, the officers who were involved in the, the homicide investigation and, and the pursuit. Um, you know, I watched that video Sunday morning and these officers are getting shot at for a long time by this guy. Uh, the Kansas Highway Patrolman had a bullet in the radiator of his car that they found when they serviced the car. And um, our officers got shot at getting out where when the guy got into K-10, Eudora officers got shot at when they were setting up their spike strips and they all remained calm. And when this thing was all over, um, Officer Henderson, you've seen him in here from time to time. He's one of our K-9 officers, got a lot of tattoos. Um, he took control of the situation. He ordered all the officers to stay back once this guy got on K-10 because there was no reason at that point for us to be up on top of him while he's shooting a gun at us. And then when, the, when it's all done and his car stops, you didn't see what you see on TV where like a bunch of officers run out and run up to the car. You saw this truck, probably I'm guessing a hundred feet away from where the officer's cars are. They all wait, they get a drone out, they get this drone up so they can see all inside of the car. The officers get ballistic shields out. They get less, less lethal uh, munitions out and they order them back and they all waited behind cover. And it was just a, textbook way to handle a felony car stop. And at the end of the day, he went home safe. We went home safe and everything came out the way it should. And that should be on the news, but it's not, but if it had gone wrong, it would be. And so um, I just want to commend them and, and share with you how proud I was of them and how proud I am to be the chief and, and working with all these great people. So thank you. Thank you, chief. I did have one question that's not nearly as interesting um, because I want to make sure that staff is looking at how to take that off your plate. And that's the parking complaints, which we've talked about in the past, how we could maybe get that off um, your list of responsibilities. Um, how can other departments and staff help you do that? Code enforcement. I mean, indeed, we do have uh, parking enforcement downtown, but they have a very limited. Right. We, we can't really expand right now in that way. Um, but it seems like sometimes it might be a, a friendly letter to the landlord or something like that. <laughs> there that, you go. that may be code enforcement to do. How can um, uh, other staff or other departments help take that off your plate? And we're working with them to identify some of those things, but also what we're doing internally and it wasn't part of the discussion tonight, but it was in the, the budget. We're working on civilianizing um, some of these calls. So we're looking at which calls require an officer with a gun and a badge and which ones can be handled just as effectively without that. We've got uh, teleserve officers right now that uh, most of them are, are limited duty officers because they're injured. Those guys are handling about 300 reports a month. Um, it's a large number. We're also thinking about some community service officers that could handle things like non-injury accidents. So maybe we've got a retired officer who in Lawrence, our officers retire very young, who wants to kind of stay um, connected, but they don't want to be dealing with the shift work and all of the nonsense that goes along with uh, being a sworn police officer. They could handle act, non-injury accidents, parking complaints, those kinds of things. So we're looking at some ways to, uh, because hiring police officers right now is not easy. We're looking at some ways to be able to hire people who maybe don't want to be police, but they don't mind handling these kinds of duties. And that would help us with that. And we're working at trying to gain some efficiencies across the departments to help with that too. <laughs> thank you very much. Yes, thank all of you for being here and for um, your report. Um, we do need to ask if there's any public comment in the room. I'm not seeing any. Is there any public comment on this uh, work session item online? If so, you can raise your hand digitally. Chris Flowers. Yeah, I was just wondering earlier, they were mentioned about, um, I think the police having kind of a lot of overtime hours. I was just wondering if there's any way they could figure out a way to train where they don't go into overtime. Like, could they be doing some of the more training on the job and not, I, I don't know. It just seems like, like they should be, we should figure out a way where, they're not using quite as much overtime over something involving training. Like, shouldn't that be, can't we figure out a way to train without going into overtime? Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Stephen Watts. Hey, 
Hi. I arrived late to the meeting, I'm sorry, he said to himself. You know, this emphasis on training has a great deal of questions because of what value is a training in de-escalation or non-biased intervention when these police want to go to warrior training and learn how to kill people and go home and have good sex. That's what the reports have been all about in terms of the training. There's been no discussion about why are the police being sent to warrior training? Has that stopped? You know, I had to, because I'm late to the meeting, I had to look at it uh, uh, through the video and I'm seeing these things about, wow, it's just, it's just so incredible that everything's based on training and everything's going to get all skippy. It's not. We need a citizen's police review board that oversees the police. When are you going to do that? It's been three years on this last effort. This has been going on for more than 45 years. At any rate, I'm glad that there is an effort with the police department to look at things differently. How about hiring social workers and psychologists instead of police? Integrate them into the department. Lawrence has an opportunity to be progressive, but it continues to go back and look at the way we've always done it. This issue with respect to can the police threaten, once again, it is sent to Nowheresville as the almost 200,000 and in excess of $200,000 a year employees when you count their benefits packages and the perquisites that come with it, want more time to answer a question about why these guys do this, that, and the other. Here you go. Let's get the police out of the schools. That doesn't, that takes responsibility away from them. They don't need that responsibility. Get them out of the schools and save a million dollars and send them over here to this section of town to enforce parking laws. Ms. Shipley, you may think that parking is not an integral aspect of policing, but it really is when you are impacted by something like the University of Kansas that has people parking everywhere. So it's a multifaceted problem and I appreciate the challenges that everybody is confronted with. I can say that the current chief, as long as he stays in office, you know, you don't know, we've got a police force that, you know, they can come together and say, well, we don't like our new boss. Oh, real good. Thank you. Your time. Thank you, Ms. Shipley. Have a good day. Is there anyone else online? That's all the comments, Mayor. Uh, any further discussion from the commission? Other than thanks? Um, I had a couple of pieces. Um, in addition to thanks, and I know that Vice Mayor Larson, um, to get share her, her appreciation for everyone being here and I echo the same sentiments. Um, there are a couple of things that I wanted to kind of hit on real quick. I know in some of the presentations um, around, uh, shoot, find it real quick. So in the engage and empowerment teams, they were talking about strategies and the list of the strategies. And I do appreciate um, those being reiterated. I think what I was listening for that I didn't necessarily get this evening was how we're operationalizing that. So um, the strategy is, is, is the blueprint. I, I wanna hear more about some of the action items around this. So, and I don't know if that's gonna come out of the, you know, the employee survey that will help to lead to how do we operationalize um, opportunities for innovation and improvement. What does that look like within these strategies? So I'll be listening more for that, that we've identified what the plan is, how we're going to execute these things and recognize successes and appreciation. What does that look like? I, I would like to hear, have an opportunity in the next outcome um, cycle to hear more about what does that look like so that I can, when communicating with constituents, I can say, when we look at this strategy, this is what, this looks like in fruition. So I think that was that was a piece there. Um, you know, in regards to to DEI work, and, and I'm I'm happy to hear that um, 
that we have that pointed out in, in the police, um, in our in our police, in our law enforcement, um, and how that comes together with all our different uh, groups. And so um, I just wanted to, it's, it speaks to DEI, but it speaks to all of this work about the operationalization of this. And so, you know, as we give these reports, you know, I, what I listen for is how are we operationalizing these strategies in the individuals, the people that's doing the work and the policies that we put in place in the pedagogy of what we do and as well as in the practice. So just a little, you know, store that away, review on the video, you know, Commissioner Sellers, when she's listening to outcomes and strategies and commitments, she's wanting to, I, I like to hear, how does this look in play? How is this looking in the playbook? And we talked about it with some of the tra trainings and I'm excited about that. Another place where we talked about it, and I know Megan uh, brought this up in her presentation about the um, Kids Are Good Business Assessment. Um, that is work that I'm familiar with on the state level with our All In For Kansas Kids. And it's truly a great assessment that businesses can use to identify, um, you know, to use a little bit of jargon, blind spots, bright spots and opportunities to fill the value gap as it relates to, to care and, and child care and access to child care. Um, we call it the, in, in my work, the three-legged bar stool. That, that's the availability, affordability, and accessibility of child care. It's been utilized in other iterations, but it started in child care. And so how are we making ourselves a more fa family friendly place? So I'm, Megan, I'm glad you brought that up. Um, there was do, 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 do. So KCSL operationalization. Um, the concern overall that I'm hearing with the training piece and how do we increase those numbers? And we know that, you know, whether it's our fire and medical or it's our law enforcement, um, ours require folks to fill in the gap that looks at um, overtime. And I think what we are faced with is um, the realization of workforce and what does that look like and how do we get to a point where we can be we can realize that in order for a staff of this much in fire and medical or a staff of this much in in our police department in order for them to get their hours it means this much time off of the beat off the clock and what does that mean as we fill that value gap so I know that was brought up that we talked about four thousand hours of overtime that to me, helps me understand that how do we take that innovation and look at workforce scheduling, recruitment, retention, things of that nature. So I'm glad that that part was that that was brought up, and that's where my mind was going. And then the last piece I had it was in slide 13, um, Chief. To your point about the the citations and crashes. Um, and I, I would almost challenge to maybe look at this as a data point and perhaps a heat map. We have great GSI, um, GIS uh, individuals here. And maybe there's a, you know, to your point of how do we pinpoint education and whatnot, and maybe heat map these citations and crashes, you know, are there, you know, to that point, hot spots? What does that look like? What do the crashes look like? Is it certain age? Is it in certain ages of individuals? Is it certain times of day? So then maybe there's an opportunity there. So this is a way of using data technology and our, our key indicators to, to, to help with the education piece. And so that was just a little add there for that. I just have a quick one, um, and this is just a comment. Uh, I was really glad to hear from Megan that uh, the emphasis on the um, um, mental health and our support for it, especially for first responders, uh, given especially what Major Cooper uh, explained the event that happened recently and uh, how honestly traumatic it could be for a person, no matter who you are, to be shot at, um, you will definitely have some memory of that. So the the fact that we're devoting that much time and energy to that, I'm really glad to see that um, because uh, those those folks definitely need it. So thank you guys for showing. Oh, one more thing. Um, and this is more for staff. I know that you know President Biden came out with his um, what is it Safer American Plan, and there is a piece in there about funding for police. But to the point that was made by Mr. Flowers and how we re envision and reimagine police, if there's a way that we can maybe dig into, does that mean actual law enforcement officers, or is there some opportunity there to reimagine policing to that piece, whether it's a peace officer or 
crisis intervention officers, I mean, individuals, you know, to the point of what we've been using now that we've been doing that's been a model to this, you know, in the country, but we haven't told our story. Just in that, that plan, what does it mean by funding for police and promoting prosecution of crimes and families? Is there some more guidance around what does that look like as far as uh, hiring? That's all. Very good. All right. Uh, thank you very much again, all for being here. Um, and um, we've uh, had a short night, surprisingly. Um, let's move on, uh, if you don't mind, everyone, to our commission items. Is there anything that commissioners would like to bring up? Uh, just, just my one quick thing. Um, it, and you mentioned the short night that made me think of it. Uh, just, uh, just to continually uh, have us explore ways to hopefully streamline our meetings, try to find any sort of avenue that we can. Um, I know that we work really hard and work our staff hard. And, um, and uh, if we can find ways to not stay as late sometimes, I, I would really appreciate it, so. Any other commission items? Um, you good? The city manager's report, Diane? Good evening, Mayor and Commissioners. Um, just uh, three general items for you this evening, and I don't have a lot to report on or highlight, so I'd be happy to answer any questions if you have them. Are there any questions? Uh, this is a public comment item. Is there anyone in the room who would like to comment on the city manager's report? Is there anyone online who'd like to comment on the city manager's report? Stephen Watts. I'm sorry, that hand was up for another matter. So I won't comment on that because it's not the city manager's report. I'm a nice guy. Thank you. Bye. Um, I, I, a couple of pieces. I know, um, I know we received the final report on the homeless needs assessment. We, I, I imagine, I know we have coming up safe and welcoming. Um, so hopefully we can kind of dig into that during that time. Um, most of my comments about it, we probably be here for way longer than I want us to be here, but I do have some current concerns about the report. And I think it, it dovetail real nicely into um, the presentation that Leah gave us in June. So um, hopefully we can, this will be part of that report and then we can have some discussion about that then. Um, in regards to the, it's a little bit, it's a germane to the parking meter um, uh, report or update. I can't, re I, I looked back in the downtown master plan. I don't think it was a downtown master plan. It may have been a 2017 report that we, that the city was looking at changing the enforcement time on the meters and wanted to see if that was something we could um, bring up. I'm kind of dovetailing into future agenda items, but maybe get a report on where we are with that or at least bring that up as a discussion item as far as the enforcement and changing the enforcement, looking at to uh, exploring the possibilities of changing the enforcement time on the meters. Yeah, yeah I seem to recall um, Brad Harrell said that he would be able to bring some kind of report to us. Mm -hmm. And I, I agree, because I think an interesting point that um, the downtown retailers particularly brought up is that people get uh, tickets during the daytime, but not at the nighttime. And we haven't really revisited that in a long time. I don't know. Yeah. But yeah. You're yeah. Right. That was part uh, of our 19 point plan, parking right. plan back, I don't know, 17, 18, something like that. So, I mean, d just to, as far as that whole pro whole um, topic is maybe to get an update on where we're at with that 19 point plan, because that was part of that. And it sounds there might be three of us at least in, interested, interested in having a real conversation sure. about extending hours or um, just to throw that on poor Bradley's pile. 
we'll get that scheduled. Um, and uh, to follow up on Commissioner Sellers' uh, question, um, how does staff see uh, giving us a chance to really dig into the data and the details uh, in the future? Would it be on the welcoming neighborhoods or what are you guys thinking? Yes, Mayor, I think that would be a good suggestion. So we can certainly bring it back as part of one of the future reports for the strong welcoming neighborhoods. I think that would be very appropriate and we'll be sure to um, include the link for the final report for the opportunity to have some more additional discussion. Will that give staff a little time to think about it, it as well to yes, dig I into it so. themselves and possibly the different agencies that are involved in trying to digest all of this as well so i think that's uh, good timing and we can certainly plan for that in the near future great thank you uh there's a public comment tonight um yeah i did didn't I? you're done yeah. okay <laughs> uh calendar items oh, calendar is there anything that needs to be added to the calendar Mm -hmm. oh, okay all right that brings us to move to adjourn oh, okay <laughs> second i have a first and second all those in favor aye aye thank you everyone you guys ellsworth county would know for real county.